Actually, it was great. I've met you a couple of times, but it was great jamming with you at NAM uh, this yeah. year, 2018. That was a really fun. Uh, that was a really fun Legere, Rovner, Jody Jazz jam. I thought it was really cool. Talent was off the charts. And yeah, a lot of amazing sax players on the stage at one time, even. <laughs> I know, and they couldn't even all fit on the stage. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. So, um, do me a favor. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions with regard to your playing and, and your influences and all that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, let's see. So uh, I am, let's see, 34 years old, and I've been playing, I guess, for like 22 or so years. You know, I had the typical middle school upbringing in the U.S., you know, a, a funny story that I, you know, I didn't even want to play an instrument, but my parents, you know, they like made me pick an instrument when I was in sixth grade. You know, you got to play something. It's like, I looked at all the instruments and it was like, hmm, the saxophone looks really expensive. I'm going to make them buy me that. And so that was, I picked the saxophone to kind of get back at them. Awesome. And now, of course, that's, that's what I do with my life. Uh, you know, I, I'd say I, you know, people will ask about like, like the like the, how much talent versus hard work you know for me i just feel like if i had any talent it was that i can sit in a room by myself for hours a day and practice you know and as a kid that's kind of you know that not every kid can do that and so i don't think i necessarily picked up the saxophone really quickly like i didn't just like start just playing scales Super well. It was just I was willing to actually practice, and that's I think been true today. Is that my brain when I'm playing? And we can get in all the details of what I'm doing when I'm doing the solo stuff, but there isn't really any magic to it. It's just that I just put in a lot of time and I do stuff really slowly and really repetitively okay. <laughs> until I can speed it up. And then people, of course, they see the the finished product, and then you know then it might seem like magic, but it's it's not at all. There's no no super ability. It's just that I put in the time to practice. No, um, no magic pills. Exactly. Yeah, I wish there were. But yeah, so um, I was, you know, I was just playing saxophone in kind of the, you know, the quote unquote normal way, um, doing band stuff. I got into jazz, you know, from some recordings that some maybe some family members gave me. But I, I didn't even really know what jazz or improvisation was until I got to college. And, you know, when I went to I did decide to, to major in music because uh, I was, you know, I was like, hey, I, I really like doing this. Um, had no idea what it would take to, like, you know, like perform full time or to teach. I didn't really know. I just knew that music was the thing I liked the most. And it was the thing that I was most willing to put that time towards. You know, I'd taken some lessons in high school. Then I got to college and then I really got bit by the, the jazz bug, as they say. And then, you know, got into the, uh, you know, the classic Jazz saxophonist, the Charlie Parkers, John Coltrane, Sonny Rollins was probably my favorite at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, and I was doing, uh, it was kind of like a double performance major in classical and jazz, both at the same time. And that was, that was interesting for me. And I think I actually played a big role in my development because I never really felt like I totally belonged 100% in one or the other. Um, in kind of a way, like when I was growing up that it felt very, I felt incomplete or I felt, you know, like, ah, I just don't know where my true calling is. And, and I would use that as an excuse when I, when I, when I heard some really good classical players, I'd be like, well, that's cause I'm, I'm more of a jazz guy. And then, and then when I'd be playing at a jam session, I'd be hearing somebody just, you know, just tearing it up and I'd be like. Well, that's because I can do classical music, you know, and so I was kind of in between floating back and forth. And it's funny, still to this day, I still don't really know exactly where I fit, but I will, I can look back and I can almost be glad that I didn't 100% just like, oh, I'm just going to be a Charlie Parker guy, or I'm just going to be with the French saxophone school because it got me to kind of pull from, from all sides. 
Yeah. Um, and that's a place where I often am in life, not even just music, but a lot of times just kind of struggling being pulled from both sides, not really knowing where I belong. But once again, that like that can lead to good things if you sit, aren't afraid to sit in that difficult spot. You know, it's interesting, though, what you did, and actually, it's just funny, I was just reading an article about uh, an interview with Maceo Parker, and uh -huh. he said to himself, all right, I hear that, I don't want to be that, I want to be myself, and that's exactly what you did. You found your own voice. Yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't easy, it wasn't fast, and... Yeah, it's interesting because it wasn't like I even set out to like, I'm going to do, I de well, I definitely was not like, I'm going to do solo saxophone concerts around the world, you know. Uh, that only has happened in the last like three, maybe even two years. Um, because so undergrad, you know, I said I was doing the, the classical and the jazz thing. And then I was at Hope College in Holland, Michigan. And then I went to, uh, to grad school at univers the University of Cincinnati. And there I was kind of strictly jazz, it was a jazz studies major. Um, and there, that was when I first started to just hear these more unusual sounds on the saxophone. And actually, even in undergrad, I was, you know, I was always kind of interested, you know, a lot of my friends were only listening to, you know, like Charlie Parker for the whole year, you know, or only this person or that person. And I think there is there is a point to that. And I think there are definitely definitely times when you want to do that, when you're, you know, you're just learning the vocabulary, you want to zero in. You want to you want to get this person's sound, get in their head, and then maybe then you want to move on to this person, and you get in their head and this. For me though, I was I had a hard time doing that, and I was often I wasn't just listening to jazz music or classical, but I was also like listening to like stuff from the world music section of the library, oh, yeah. and just checking out so much stuff that I maybe normally wouldn't you know that I wouldn't listen to normally just in a car ride you know but just like what's this stuff music from africa or music from western eastern europe and um so i'd always kind of had a knack for listening to unusual things and not just saxophone things that's kind of a key thing too is to not not only trying to sound like what's out there oh, yeah. and i wasn't even listening to this stuff thinking like oh how am i going to use this on the saxophone it's just a just a curiosity and you know i always recommend that to students just like get interested in stuff and dig deeper. And, you know, you never know how that's going to affect you. But I do remember hearing some things like particularly uh, the band Bela Fleck and the Flecktones, okay. uh, one of my favorite bands of all time. And Jeff Coffin, one of my favorite sax players in that group. I remember him making some percussive sounds, just these like, <laughs> just that kind of sound. And it was kind of as like an effect and kind of like a free jazz kind of thing. Um, and to me, instead of just being like, oh, that was cool and moving on, it was like, oh, my gosh, I have to learn how he did that, you know, and kind of researching on my own. And this was something like my sax teachers couldn't really help me with. They weren't in that thing. And then just kind of pursuing that and finally figuring out how to make that sound. While then at the same time, you know, hearing from another genre like classical from classical saxophone, hearing a sound like the slap tonguing sound. Uh, and being like, oh my gosh, I have to learn that. And and to me, that sounded like a like a slap bass. That other sound sounded like a drum. And it's like, I wonder if I could kind of put those together a little bit in my playing. Um, and and even at that point, it wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna now, I'm gonna do solo saxophone around the world. And you know, it was just like, oh, I wonder if I can kind of just add that in, sprinkle that in to what I'm already doing, and kind of have fun with that. Wow. So, wow. yeah, I, I, I can talk a lot more about that evolution if you want or or the other stages. But, yeah, that's where I was at at that point. That's really fascinating. Um, I'm wondering your your thought process at the time. OK, so this is like around grad grad school, a little bit afterwards. You you decided to be a professional professional saxophone player or a teacher. So I. In undergrad and grad, I was mainly thinking about doing performing. I was dreaming, you know, a lot of a lot of us really don't know what that will mean when we got up and like how hard that might be. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, 
oh yeah, I'm just gonna go to after school, grad school, I'll just go to New York City and just like join some bands and playing clubs, not really knowing anything about the music industry or what it would take. Um, the, the teaching thing happened uh, just as I was about to graduate after grad school, an old teacher of mine uh, down in Texas called me and said, hey, Derek, uh, I'm not sure what you're planning on doing after grad school, but the jazz director spot just opened up at Abilene Christian University. I think you'd be a great fit to try out. And it was just like, hmm, teaching. I, I, never, I didn't think of that full time. I, I was teaching students up to this point, but I was like, I mean, I'll give it a shot. I have no experience running a jazz band, you know, teaching classes, but if they want me, sure, let's try it. And so I flew down there and I ended up getting offered the gig. And it's just like, okay, here we go. Let's try it. <laughs> so then, you know, not having experience teaching and doing all that stuff, how was that process for you and your students? Like what, you know, you were starting to explore some beatbox elements, so to speak, but I'm assuming, you know, that wasn't part of your teaching style. I'm sure it was more traditional. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my teaching style at all. And it's funny, a lot of my, some of my students and some of the other faculty members, after I moved back up to Chicago and, and started releasing these videos of the solo stuff, people were like, Derek, where did this come from? We never saw any of this when you were teaching. And I, I have to be honest, when I was a teacher, and I think it was because I was so young, I just started you know, full time at 25. I was, I just very much wanted to fit in. And I just wanted to like not rock the boat. And you know, I think so many people, when you start a new job or when you're like starting a new school on your instrument, that's always kind of like your number one goal is to not screw up. It's yeah. not, you're not thinking about like, oh, how can I, you know, soar? It's just like, I just don't want to be seen as a screw up. Don't, don't judge me. And, and that was me, especially for the first few years of teaching. I did it for six years. And, and by the end, I started to, to loosen up and get into the role. That being said, with what I've done now in like the last, I guess, three and a half years since teaching, I think if I were to go back, I would be a much different teacher um, just because the experience that I've already had, just of life as a kind of a, you know, a performing musician on the road. And also I just, I've just become more kind of secure in who I am. You know, I mentioned that whole being in between and, you know, always being in, it, feeling inadequate about each. Now I feel like I kind of have something to say and I, you know, can hopefully help people find that themselves or at least can relate, you know, on that journey. Definitely. And, you know, it, I'm glad that you brought up that point again, because, you know, I think for a lot of us, you know, when you were first saying how you felt like you were in between categories or, you know, not totally jazz or not totally classical, I, I could totally relate to that, you know, um, and I think a lot of people can. And they just, you know, I think find it as fascinating as I do. But, you know, what's interesting, um, and like I alluded to the Maceo Parker article before, you know, a lot of us tend to then just, OK, we'll just let's just go to that one category and let's just stick with that. Let's be safe. But the funny thing is you're saying, oh, you know, you wanted security and that kind of thing, but you actually started something, you actually revolutionized how to play the saxophone. You defined another area of playing, which is not so safe. You know, it's definitely taking a risk and it's definitely putting yourself out there in such a way that, you know, there's, especially with the age of social media, you know, all these, um, you know, these people can be so negative. It's like people are in their car. You know, you could just everybody has road rage in their car, but, you know, they wouldn't say it to somebody's face. Well, it's the same thing on social media. But you yeah. put yourself out there and I think it's great. I think it's fantastic because I think that that story of courage and taking risk and following through. And as you said before, it wasn't a magic pill. It took a long time. And I think that uh, that classical background really added to the technique, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm -hmm. And even more so than, you know, hearing a couple of, uh, you know, uh, classical solos with the slap tonguing. I think it's just really added to the technique and stuff like that. So I really admire that, you know, and, and I think that's just an amazing thing. So taking, you. taking us on, on that journey, you know, you talk about like sometimes feeling, you know, in the past feeling insecure because you'd felt like you weren't in a certain category and stuff like that. So, you know, moving ahead, I guess, in your life, uh, where do you see yourself five years from now, 
10 years from now? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, cause I definitely don't have like a five year plan for my musical, you know, stuff. Um, maybe I should, uh, one, one thing is I get into that kind of on what you were saying about like the taking a risk thing, um, that I always want to kind of think about one is that like, yes, I, I always like to live with these kind of like, I don't know, these kind of competing dichotomies, things of like, one, it was a big risk for me, but two, on the other hand, it's like a bigger risk would have been not to take a risk for me. Yeah. And that has to do with the fact that as a jazz player, if you want to make it in the world as a jazz player, performer, you just have to be like, I mean, you have to be one of the best of the best, like, like top 20 in the world to get noticed. And like, I think I'm, okay as a jazz player i'm pretty good uh but i am not in the tw top 20 by any means of like being able to improvise uh and same thing with classical you know to survive in that world you just have to be the absolute best of the best and so for me if i were to quote unquote play it safe that would mean following in those in those direct shoes and not ever getting noticed because I wasn't doing anything different. I wasn't sticking out. And so for me, that taking a risk, that was the only way that I think I would get noticed. You know, I, uh, and, and not even to say that it's all about getting noticed or whatever, you know, I think there are a lot of amazing, amazing jazz players, you know, playing in clubs in Chicago, New York, LA, you name it. And they're not, you know, they're not world famous or they don't just have these viral videos and they're, and, but they're, they're loving it and they're doing great. And that's, that's awesome for them. Um, that being said, it is oftentimes difficult <laughs> for some of those people to actually make a living with that. And maybe they're working a side job or something. And that's, that's also totally great. Um, but yeah, so for me, uh, like how I, how I started to realize what was kind of working for me. Um, so when I was, when I was teaching, that was when I was really working on kind of the background of the behind the scenes of this like solo beatbox sax thing. It was those six years when I was teaching and it was kind of nice cause I almost had the pressure taken off me. Yeah. Um, I sometimes think if I had moved to New York or Chicago right after grad school, I would have just gotten plugged into bands and I only would have been thinking about, you know, fitting into those bands. And like I was saying, the pressure of just not screwing up, but being, being, having another full-time job kind of took the pressure off of like, I don't have to make all my money from performing, you know, and I've, I've heard people suggest to others, like keep your day job as long as you can, because it takes the pressure off. You don't have to take every single gig that comes your way. Um, you know, it, it, it kind of depends on the person you are. Some people need that extra motivation, whatever. But for me, it was like, oh, I have this full-time job. I'm kind of around music, which is cool. But then in the time in between classes and whatnot, that was when I could just practice and just like, just experiment with no worries of judgment. And so I was kind of doing that for those six years. And I wasn't playing out a ton. I still did struggled with confidence. I didn't think I was the greatest, but I was, I, it was just fun working on this stuff on my own. And that was actually why I think the solo stuff started to happen is because I wasn't playing with a lot of other musicians. There weren't even a lot of other music. It was kind of a smaller town, Abilene, Texas. So I was, when I was just thinking about, I wonder, I kind of want to full as full of a sound as possible when I just play by myself, you know, well, I wonder, you know, doing bass lines and uh, percussion with the sax. Uh, but when I moved to Chicago, uh, I remember even at that point, I wasn't thinking, I'm going to be a solo sax player. I keep coming back to that theme, that that was not my plan. Uh, but I was like, you know, I, I had the mindset of I'm going to, I'm living in this city. This is an amazing experience that not everybody has. I'm going to go to every jam session I can. I'm going to go just like talk to every band. And I did. And, and that was tough for me. I feel like deep, deep down, I'm actually more of an introvert or at least like a li leaning that way. And so it was tough for me to like every night I'd go out and see a different band. I'd go, go to jam sessions, force myself to get up on stage. After, you know, a few months or so, I finally got connected with some groups. I started my own group. Um, and at the same time I started doing all those things, I was just always kind of, I like to reflect on like what's working or not. Um, and I remember like putting out a couple of video, like I put like a little demo of like a band I was in 
a band that I started. And then I put out this video of this, this solo sax video. And of course, after looking at what happened, you know, the solo sax stuff just started taking off. And at the same time, too, it was just like oh, I'm in two other bands, I'm doing the solo stuff, I'm going to all these jam sessions. I just couldn't keep it all up. Yeah. And that was when it was like, I got to I have to, to focus right now. Um, and, and, and this is a huge part of like, I think a person's career is when you're, you know, you're young and you're beginning, you say yes to everything and you should, you know, when you're in high school, college, be in everything you can, listen to everything, experiment with all those different groups. Then once you start getting some focus, some vision, and for me, that was, oh, the solo stuff is, you know, it's connecting with people. That's when you then can say, start to say no to these other things. So it's like, yeah. Uh, I like doing that, that, uh, you know, that dance band, but I can't, I'm sorry. And uh, I like going to these jam sessions, but I got to practice more. And this gig pays a lot, but I just, it's draining. And so then it was, this is what I'm going to do. And once again, for me, that was like, it was risky doing this solo thing. And I could talk about how hard it is sometimes pursuing that. But at the same time, that's what really, you know, I noticed that people were saying that that's what made me unique. That was seemed to be the thing that was connecting with people in this new way. And so I kind of had to follow that risk. Yeah. And, and, and actually, you were drawn to it, too. That's awesome advice. I got to tell you. And, and, you know, we do hear a lot of people saying, you know, to the young folks, take every opportunity, take every, every opportunity. But the key thing that you said, and this is so important, is that vision. If you can't see, if you can't see yourself in the situation that you want, or you, if you don't have that 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 visual idea of where you want to go, you're just going to be just going along for the ride and not, you know, not having any focus. You know, we talk a lot about that, like with the law of attraction and you know visualization and that kind of thing. And I think the key thing for the young folks, but even for any saxophone player, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have a day job or not, actually in this economy, you kind of, in a sense, need to. It does take the pressure off, you know, absolutely. But if you don't have a vision of where you want to go, um, you're not going to get there, you know. You're just not going to achieve that dream. I think that's uh, it's really powerful stuff. And what's also really powerful about what you said, too, that I think a lot of people can feel relieved to hear is that someone, you know, now as really good as you are and as popular as you are, saying that you felt insecure, saying that you felt nervous, saying that you felt, you know, <laughs> like, oh, I have to, this jam session, oh, I got to get my horn up, do I really want to do this? You know, it's actually, it's kind of a relief, I think. For yeah, yeah. To hear that. I, I mean, I, I still, you know, I think a lot of, uh, or probably everybody, we still struggle with, with insecurities. Um, like, you know, like even at the jazz jam, you know, there's just so many amazing, amazing players and it's, it's sometimes tough to follow somebody else that you hear. The one thing that helped has helped me is the fact that I now, because I kind of have that vision or that kind of thing that I want to say, kind of my specialty or whatever, yeah. I can feel good in that. And I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm not threatened now by hearing a great player, you know, a great jazz improviser. Because it's like, yeah, this is, if you want to hear me improvise over the blues, you know, that's not necessarily what I'm known for but I'll, I'll do it but you know it's just like this isn't necessarily my thing and then and then the one other thing uh is is just as as we talked about like as you were talking about the the vision and finding that focus that's so key one thing just for listeners to keep in mind is that for me it took me 18 years to find that <laughs> so because i know like you know like a lot of people i know that is a bit a constant struggle, whether they're a musician or not. I'm just like, ah, oh, what's my calling? What am I, you know, what is my main purpose? And that's why I was like, you know, just say yes to everything. And you can start to then narrow it down and you'll eventually find some things. Absolutely. And you know, I just realized something too. I wanted to ask this before. So you didn't necessarily want to start off playing an instrument and then you said, okay, saxophone, that looks really expensive. Let me let my parents buy that. Um, your first couple of years, were you, you had mentioned that you, you were practicing quite a bit, but were, were you at, at first? I mean, cause you weren't like really into it right away. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't want to do an instrument, but as soon as I got the saxophone, it kind of was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, I did, I did enjoy it. Um, 
And, you know, I said I didn't just like pick up things crazy fast, but I I was willing to put in the time. And it's funny when you're a sixth grader, putting in the time means I'm doing quotes all the time. It's good that we're uh, this is an visual podcast. <laughs> putting in the time as a middle schooler means like literally practicing 15 minutes, you know, every day. That's like 15 minutes more than most of my bandmates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so back then, you know, that was like a fair amount. That was good. And then I think within maybe a year, I started taking weekly lessons and there, you know, with the teacher, I had to practice more, you know, a lot of times you don't want to, um, you know, but I feel like, you know, I'm grateful for my teachers for fine keeping ways to keep it interesting. That's always so key. You know, as I was, as I've taught lessons and college students, the number one most challenging thing as a teacher, but the most important thing as a teacher, I think, is is keeping your students motivated, is yeah. help, helping them to be inspired by the music. Because if they're not inspired, if they're not motivated, and we all go through those times, but if they're not, they're not going to want to practice. And when they don't want to practice, they find ways not to practice. Yeah. <laughs> and that's better. And so for me, you know, it was things like, you know, I remember some of my early teachers presenting me with like the Jamie Abersole play alongs. And it was like, I didn't really know what I was doing, but yeah, playing that watermelon man, you know, that was just so fun. Another thing early on with me, even though I'm not, it's not maybe my favorite genre of music to listen to, but I, when I was learning the saxophone, I was really into smooth jazz. And that was, I think really key for me, just hearing this really powerful, beautiful saxophone tone uh, of these players, like I remember had uh, a Dave Koz, a couple of Dave Koz CDs. And I loved taking, I had, you know, a boom box back then. And I would take it out, my CD player boom box into the garage because there was like more echo in the garage. And I would just like turn out the lights and I would put on the Dave Koz CD and I would just play along. I sounded so terrible, I'm sure, but I'd close my eyes and it was just like envisioning, you know, playing on a stage. But that actually got me, you know, I enjoyed that stuff. No teacher was telling me to do that. Um, but it got me to, and it, it also just got me to really like play out and just, you know, just to imagine and just, you know, that, that stuff's just so important for students. And it's so hard as a teacher to define that for each, you know, each student. Um, but that's, you know, that's really key. Let me ask you something. Um, I want to talk about, I want to talk about things that most people don't ask you. So I want to talk about, you know, like your practice routine growing up, you know, the various stages, practice routine, you know, from your first teachers, practice routine when maybe you were in high school, practice routine when you were as an undergrad, as a grad student, practice routine now. So can you go through some of that? Yeah. Let's go month by month. Okay. <laughs> July of 1992. No. Um, Okay, when I started, you know, I think I had the, uh, you know, the basic band book that we all, you know, different bands, they have just these little etudes, exercises, not doing much, you know, playing the, the simple sing-songy kind of tunes, and then like that Dave Kaz stuff, just kind of playing along. Then when I started doing lessons, you know, a lot of, a lot of students, once they get interested in music, maybe by like late middle school, high school, Band is not enough. Like the band music is not enough to keep you occupied, interested. You know, you got to go beyond that. And so with my teachers, that was when, you know, the Abersold stuff was introduced. That was when I first got into, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe in high school, I got into the Rubank, um, you know, the 48 famous stuff. Not, Ru I'm sorry, not Rubank. Uh, 48. Close. There was, um, no, what in the world? Rubank is the beginning. Uh, ah, I have the book. The, 40, the, the 48 Famous Studies. Oh, Furling. Uh, Furling. Furling. I had Rubank in my... There it is. Yes. <laughs> I spent so much time with the Furling, especially in college. Um, and let's see, you know, and doing those solo, solo and ensemble competitions you know in the spring i mean it was it's funny my life was like my musical life was like built around that solo and ensemble and i put so much pressure on myself for that unnecessarily i remember even like i think i like cried after one of the but i still got like a, a one but i didn't feel good about it i was just so intense about playing in front of in front of others 
Uh, and let's see. And it wasn't until college that I, okay. So maybe up in high school, I got to where maybe I was doing like an hour most days practicing. Okay. Um, and it was mostly classical, with a little bit of jazz and then a little bit of this kind of like, kind of like Dave Cos transcribing kind of stuff. And then it was when I got to college, that was when, when it hit. And the, the best thing I ever did for my music career probably was the first, my freshman year Christmas break. I, you know, I had my, like a lot of, like a lot of college students, I brought my GameCube, my Nintendo to, to college and I'm, you know, playing with my friends. The best thing I ever did was at Christmas break, I brought that home and I left it at home. <laughs> so I did not have that temptation because, you know, oh my gosh, so many college students, especially I know a lot of guy college students, just, we just, they just spent so much time on the video games in college. Oh. And to me, I was like, wow, what if I took these three hours every day? I was doing this and did my music instead. What would that do to my playing? Uh, and all that to, to, to be, all that being said, uh, so yeah, I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the place. In college, I remember then getting into where it was, you know, maybe three hours a day up to maybe high school or the end of college, maybe like five hours most days. Uh, and when I tell that to young people, I can see like almost like fear in their eyes. And I always have to say, okay, hold on, hold on. In high school and middle school, I was a video game addict. Like I, like I said, maybe an hour a day at the most uh, in high school. And 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 if you had told me, if you had told me when I was a high schooler that I would have to practice, that I'd be practicing five hours a day, I might have stopped playing and be like, that's not possible. Are you kidding me? But in the college setting, and this is what I remind young people that aren't there yet, when you're in a music program and you're surrounded by these, you know, these amazing musicians and you're in these really great ensembles and you have a great teacher, it's so much easier to practice. And when your friends who are in your, your fellow music friends, they're practicing hours every day. And so it's just like, it's not that weird to do that. Um, and so in undergrad, I started when I was doing all that practicing, it was, you know, that was also when I was pick, learning to double a little bit flute and clarinet for the jazz band. So that took, you know, maybe like half an hour, an hour with the both. I was doing the classical and jazz kind of full time. So maybe like a couple hours each with those, you know, I was continuing the furling stuff, getting into the classical saxophone literature, you know, like the, the Glazunov, the Eber, all those kind of pieces. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course, working on the scales and stuff. I'm also, Speaking of scales, uh, I've always been kind of a guy who actually kind of likes doing scales, which I don't know if that makes me weird or not, but yeah. it's kind of like, you know, when you're working on improvising so much, just straight up making stuff out of thin air and coming up with new stuff every time, that gets kind of mentally exhausting. <laughs> and, you know, you sometimes just need a break. And that's why, like, scales to me are like a, a it's like your mind is switched off and you're just working on muscle memory, you know? And so I could just be playing scales all day up and down. You don't, you can be, I'm thinking about the last movie I saw, you know, and just like getting that muscle memory down. But then when I have to go to something like, and nowadays when it's writing a song, that's like, it's taxing, you know, just doing the really creative side is taxing. Um, but so important. Um, so yeah. And then, so I guess, and then in college, I, I mentioned then, doing the jazz stuff that would be a lot of the scales things the patterns um specific saxophone licks that was the first time in in undergrad when i started transcribing actual like bebop solos okay. you know so working on my 251 licks you know i would you know doing it from whether that's books and then transcribing into all keys or from the recordings you know and kind of working on your ear memorizing tunes you know all that kind of standard stuff that you do in jazz uh, practicing. Fast forward then to grad school and maybe take away most of the classical stuff uh, just because it was a jazz studies degree. I was also working on jazz piano um, wow. same time. Grad school was when was kind of this big turning point because that was when I won. I like I, 
I kind of almost got burnt out with music uh, because, you know, I went straight from undergrad the four years to the grad school, no time in between. And, and cause also cause of that thing where I just didn't know exactly where I fit. Um, but I was kind of getting burnt out and I wasn't motivated to like go out and try to perform. I think also I was just comparing myself to these amazing other improvisers and just kind of like, what's the point if I'm not, you know, sticking out. And that was when I also at the same time started experimenting more with these other sounds. Um, yeah. just cause it was like, I don't know. I just didn't feel as much pressure to only just do the, the, the Coltrane sound or whatever. And that was, and I was almost kind of doing it like secretly, like, you know, I kind of joke about like being in the practice room and like, and you know, like, kind of like looking around and make sure no one's looking and I'd work. And a lot of this stuff, these extended technique stuff, like they sound really bad when you're practicing it, when you're first working on it, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't sound great. And so I was kind of, you know, I was always kind of nervous about that. Um, and, and it was, it was interesting because grad school was kind of like, I feel like the first time in my life where I wasn't overachieving. I often am, I often play, I'll be honest, like to, I have played in the past to impress people. Like that was always a goal. Like with the soul and ensemble, I had to be the best. I had to impress people I was always thinking about that and maybe it was a good thing was that in grad school, I started to relax about that where I wasn't like, I don't know. I just, I just wanted to be more me and just whatever. This is what I like. This is who I am. But the downside of that was that I, I, I wasn't as just like, Oh, so overprepared for all my lessons. And I remember just, that's why, yeah, I was just kind of losing the focus. Um, fast forward then to, my teaching career, uh, there, the practice, it was much tougher to do, you know, regular practicing and people will always, t I remember telling me when I was an undergrad saying, you'll never have more time than this in your life to practice. And this is when you're teaching like 16 credit hours and you're in five ensembles and it's just like, what? Yes. But it's true. You somehow find the time and you have these dedicated practice rooms. When you're teaching, you have a full-time job. It's just tougher to find the time. Uh, so that was when I would say, and that was why I started developing my own sound because I wasn't, I wasn't quite as regimented with just like, okay, what's the next solo I'm going to transcribe? What's the next piece I'm going to play? It was a little bit more free of just like, I don't really have a performance coming up. What do I want to work on? And so that was mainly just finding ways to motivate myself and like what, that was where I like really found out what I was made of because I didn't have pressure to perform. And so it was just like, what do I really want to play? What music do I, I also had, this isn't a thing I have, don't talk about a lot, but a big turning point in my listening and just my just music life in general was what, well, okay. You know, going through a, a university, a whatever conservatory, there, there's this kind of like, you know, jazz snob mentality or classical music and you only listen to jazz and that is superior to everything else. And I kind of was having that a little bit, um, you know, it was just like, I would look down on pop music and I started to turn my nose on smooth jazz as, oh, it's not the same. But when I was out of that and I was on my own teaching and just being like, who am I really? I remember, I remember watching the Grammys one time, like, so this was maybe just like six years ago. And it was like, Justin Bieber and Usher were doing a dance in the Grammys. And half of me was just like, oh, why is this so popular? This is, so, and I was like jealous, you know? And the other half of me was like tapping my foot and just being like, man, this is really fun music. That's why it's popular, yeah. <laughs> yes, and so that was when I started to realize that, you know, there's this whole spectrum of music, but on the two ends, there's like these two extremes of there's 100% like artsy, you know, it's, uh, it's artistic, it is challenging, it is always evolving, it's uh, gets, it's not necessarily enjoyable, you get the point. Yeah, yeah. Totally, and it's academic, That's it's hard. proving a point, getting you to think, 
And then the, on the other end of the spectrum, there's music that's just totally just like pure entertainment, totally about dancing. This is a, totally about listening to and analyzing. This is about totally entertainment dancing. And what I realized, like with food, sometimes, yes, I want a fine wine or a steak and something that a kid would not like, you know, a, a really aged blue cheese, you know, that's so complex. But then there are times I just want candy. I want McDonald's, you know, you need them both. And so that was me with music. And it was just like, sometimes, yeah, I want to be challenged by this music. I want to really think about it. It's fun to analyze it. But then sometimes I just want to have fun and just dance to it. Um, and then I also realized there's a spectrum too. And like with my music, I ideally I'm somewhere in the middle, you know, that, that it's fun music that maybe people could dance to it. Anybody could like it, but also there's like some depth in there and it's challenging for me and people could, you know, learn new things by it. Uh, and so that was, that was the key thing to just relax and be like, wow, this is all good. You know, I, I have this quote, I say, there's two types of music in this world good music and bad music and i like them both <laughs> uh and, and and so that you know that got me once again on that journey of like who am i really what do i really want to play and that was when i started incorporating these these extended techniques into a way that wasn't necessarily traditional jazz it, it wasn't classical it's just you know it's like this funky music and i took cover songs and can i play this solo style over a cover song um, and just kind of whatever came out, came out. And so as far as practicing, when I was teaching it, it was a lot, that was a lot of hardcore extended techniques where some days I would just work on like slap tonguey almost all, all my practice, or I'd work on multiphonics all this next day or blah, 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 or experimenting and just like hitting the horn and doing like, what happens if I stick the mouthpiece upside down? You know, a lot of days would sound really bad, you know, and wouldn't lead to anything. Once I then started getting the focus, ah, this is what I want to do. Now I'm in Chicago. So now the last three years, the majority of my practicing now, and I sometimes shifts around, but now it's mainly like writing, writing new songs and that that kind of dictates everything so if i get like an idea in my song in my head you know i i always have like my iphone to record just like you know just like oh here's a little thing play it and then i label it as something just so i keep all my ideas and then it's just like oh this would be cool oh if i could do i wonder if i could play this beat but put the melody there and so then, oh, and then, oh, that might need some, oh, some extra double tonguing. So I'm going to work on that double tonguing technique. And then, oh, here would be cool if I could sing at the same, do these like tartini tones. So now I'm going to practice the, you know, like the song dictates what I practice. It gave then. you a direction. It gave you exactly. a direction that you had in college, right? College, someone told you what to practice, so to speak. And now yeah. your songs, what you're creating is giving you yeah. a direction. Exactly. And, and, and it goes both ways. Sometimes, you know, I might just be messing around with a technique or something. And then that, that sparks an idea for a song. And then that leads to this. Um, the challenge is so much of the like writing songs, like I said, it's that the creative process there. It's so intense of like doing new stuff every day. Um, and so that's the challenge of, you know, writing a song, but also working on those songs, but I have to, I do have to kind of force myself. Okay. Come up with something new today. Um, and at the same time, just the last thing I'll say about the practicing, I do, I kind of now go in shifts of how much I work on, like maybe just improvising. I'm still in a, a band, one band in town, low spark. And it's kind of like a jazz rock fusion instrumental group. And it's every Thursday night. And there have been times when I'm honest, where I'm like, it, Thursday night comes around. We start at 10.30 p.m. We go 10.30 to 1.30 a.m. Oh, and there are times when the introverted part of myself is just like, I don't want to go to the, the bar tonight. I just want to stay in. My wife's like in her pajamas and like I have eating cereal, watching a movie. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. But after I'm done, you know, it's 2 a.m. and I'm going home. And I'm always glad. It was like, yeah, I'm glad I did that. It's fun with so much that I do in my own head, solo saxophone. 
and very much written down in my head. It's really good for me and fun to play with other musicians also and to just do straight up improv, uh, you know, just improvising, you know, over chord changes or vamps or whatever we do. Cause that's just like a total other side of my playing that I want to keep alive. Um, you know, you asked earlier and I didn't even really get there, but the, like what I see doing in the future, um, because I know if I just do the solo sax stuff, you know, I, I always kind of wonder like, will I ever hit a wall or I can't come up with anything new because a big thing for me is I want to keep challenging myself and doing new things. Um, and so if I ever hit a point where I just start plateauing, and it's just like, these songs all sound the same. I got nothing new. That would then be playing it safe of just like, just continuing on with it because it works, but I'm, nothing's new for me. And so, you know, I always hope to have, you know, to bring in other, other sides of the saxophone, whether that's playing with like groups or more improvisation at times or more classical things. Like for instance, now just, uh, just recently, maybe my biggest newer project is really trying to work on improvising while like doing the ring stuff that I do with my thumb oh, yeah. here and while stomping. Uh, because I, like I said, so much of what I, what I play is all pre thought out. Uh, but I want, that's kind of the next area is like, yeah, can, how free can I improvise while doing this stuff and doing bass lines? And so that's kind of another, another fun challenge of where I could go. Oh my gosh. I could see that. That's wow. That's, that's amazing. And you know, um, you know, I was going to ask you how long, like for example, the Bach cello suite, right? How mm -hmm. long does it take you to whether it's conceive of a new piece, but also, you know, take a cover. How long does it take you to work on a piece? Oh, yeah. Uh, good question. Um, it's funny. You would think it would take less and less time as I figure this out more, but it's not the case. In, in some ways, when I'm over these, particularly the last three years that I've been really working on songs now, um, certain things have gotten easier. Like when I first started out, I wrote out a lot, like physically wrote out on sheet music or in a music notation program, would write out ideas like, don't get, uh, uh, you know, cause these big, these big intervallic leaps that are hard to play, but maybe I can write it out and see what I'm trying to go for. And then experiment, or like if I did a cover, like, uh, like the Bach cello suite or something like Baby, Justin Bieber, right. like, putting the, looking at the melody and looking at the bass line out of that one, and like, how can I put the melody notes in between the bass notes? Cause I have to change it. You know, you can't obviously play the, any two notes at the same time. So it was like, Oh, what if I drag the note here and try, ah, that didn't work, cross that off. And then same thing with just coming up with my own songs of like, well, like, I want to play this melody. Anyways, nowadays I don't have to write down as much. It's a little bit easier easier to kind of know the capabilities that I have with these intervals. So that makes it easier. However, I've made it much more challenging on myself uh, in the fact that, you know, the first maybe 10 songs that I had, almost all my videos up until like my first album uh, were just like no rings at all. It was just all the percussion was done with my mouth and then just playing. And then I started realizing, oh, I can hit the sax. And I got that idea from watching guitar players hit the guitar. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, this is cool. Uh, it kind of, it's like another instrument that I'm able to do. And it, it kind of helped me out fill out the sound a little bit more. And then soon enough, I'm kind of adding this to every song. And so that now every time I write a new song, I have to think of, oh, what, what's my ring rhythm going to be? I don't just want quarter notes like da, 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 da. And so, you know, I'll practice working on scales, you know, while, I don't know if you can, you can see that. You know, and all those things take a lot of time to start getting comfortable with. And, and like with the improvising thing that I mentioned in the past, I'm now trying to do that while improvising, which is a whole nother level. Yeah. But, so, the, so the ring was one thing. And then just maybe 
six months, no, almost a year ago, I realized, oh, I could get kind of a bass sound with my foot just pounding on the ground on the stage. And so now anytime I do a new song, I'm not just thinking about the bass. I'm thinking about the bass line of the sax. I'm thinking about the melody of the sax in between. I'm thinking about like doing the backbeat pops with my slap tonguing tongue. I'm thinking about the ring rhythm that I want. I'm thinking about the bass rhythm, the foot stomping rhythm I want. And I don't like just doing quarter notes necessarily. I like, you know, whatever I want it to be. Yeah. And then I realized, oh, I can also, maybe I can sing and play at yeah. the same time. And so, and so throwing my voice. So there's just all these things to think about that. Now when I'm also, I'm, I now like, actually I'm like writing words. You know, I, I have a new album that's going to come out maybe this summer and a lot of original songs with li original lyrics. And that's a whole nother thing to like write those lyrics. That's so tough. Uh, but thinking about the words. And so anyways, when I'm practicing these songs now, it takes me so long to learn a song. Wow. Uh, I often split it up. You know, I'll work on a little bit of this song, a little bit of this song and this one in one day, but I'll sometimes have to be like, Derek, why is it take me? Why is it taking me like weeks to learn this song? Or I've been working on this one for months. And then it's just, I have to remind myself, oh yeah, because I'm trying to play all the band parts by myself. <laughs> and so just trying, you know, it's like, and that's why I'm, I'm glad that I did actually like grad school. I, I started to learn how to play a little bit of drums. I was going to ask you. Yeah. So kind of working on the playing multiple things at the same time. The jazz piano helped with that. Um, another big one for me, I have it. Right here is the uh, the djembe, which I would just do like in pop settings. This was super key for me because let me slide this thing down. Because compared to the drum set on the djembe, you can only you only make one different sound at a time. Yeah. Like you can make a a bass sound, you can make a slap sound, but you can't you can't do them at the same time. Right. And you can do like hi hat, and so everything you do like. play this in, in, in years everything you, you do you every moment you have to decide is this going to be a bass sound like a kind of a side note or or a slap and and that's the same thing with the saxophone whereas whereas compared to the drum set where you can do oh i can do a bass sound and a hi-hat and a hit at the same time sax you have to decide it's gonna be a bass note melody note or one of these like side things and so that was really key of just realizing oh you can make it sound like it's all happening at the same time, but it's really just individually one note happening. Yeah. Uh, Prior prioritizing. You have to prioritize, yeah. which is going to, you know, have the most effect. I, I, this just came to me. Um, have you ever thought of playing two saxophones at once? You know, I, I've experimented with it because I've seen people like Jeff Coffin or Rasad, Roland Kirk, you know, who are masters at that. Uh, I tried it a little bit. It was really tough. And I was kind of like, oh, they do that really well. I'm, <laughs> I'm sticking with one right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's cool. I was just thinking, you know, like next steps or something like that. But that's awesome. Just the fact that you're adding your voice in too. I mean, it's, you know, it's like, yeah, your your um, your saxophone and and you, you're like, you know, they call you like a one man band, but you're you're like a full drum kit, you know. That, that's what, and I was, I'm glad that you said it because I was going to ask you, did you have any drumming experience? And that, you yeah. know, that explains it. That definitely explains it. That's awesome. Um, tell us about, so, so I was going to ask you about your upcoming projects and you did mention that you have a CD coming out in the summer. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I have a couple of big things coming up. So yeah, the new album that, you know, I have one album before currently that I just call Beatbox Sax, Derek Brown. And the truth is, I don't like the name beatbox sax because I'm not actually beatboxing. You know, I don't do it like with my mouth. There are certain sounds that I make that maybe sound like beatboxing, but it's just totally different. That being said, people, it just gives people somewhat of an idea of what to expect. And people are always just like, hey, it's not, yeah, you're the beatboxing guy. It's like, okay. It has a better to it than extended technique <laughs> but for saxophone. Uh, so, uh, yes, I have this one album in that the one album that I, that I did, maybe you may have released like two years ago, it's maybe 60, no, it's like 75% cover songs. 
uh, a mix of classical pop and jazz cover songs and then some originals. I sing on two of those cover songs. And this next album, you're going to see a lot more originals. It's mostly originals. Um, that's kind of just when, been where I'm going. It's not like I'm turning my back on cover songs. It's just, it's been fun coming up with my own stuff. Sure. Uh, and, and yeah, so maybe it's 80% original songs and 20% covers. There's, there is more singing uh, by me. And also there are a couple of special guests on this album. I have a, a rapper on a song, which I actually have a YouTube video of this, Empathique, Keith Harris. Um, I'm actually going to record that tomorrow wow. uh, with him. And even there's a guest appearance by my wife oh, on one. Awesome. <laughs> she sings a little bit. She was very nervous about it, but we're doing a duet on a, on a song. Um, so that's, so that's fun. Um, and yeah, I think the, the, I don't, I don't have a name for this album yet. I might went by the time you release this. Uh, but uh, I don't know. The style's a little bit different as just, you know, my style has evolved a little bit. It's maybe a little bit less of the funky side of things. And I think that's honestly just because it's based on like, whether it's consciously or not, a lot of the music I listen to and I do listen to a lot of pop music and I listen to a lot of eighties music or like kind of electronic music. And it's kind of a little bit more driving than maybe like as syncopated. So listeners might notice that with my new album. Um, but the really exciting thing is along with this album, uh, I'm going to be doing a 50 state tour U S tour. And so the, with the academic year, so starting September 2018 to May, through May 2019, I'm going to live on the road uh, and do at least one concert in every state, including Alaska, oh, man. And live in a van. And yeah, and so I'm really excited about this and it's going to kind of, you know, it's going to be kind of like the, the album release tour. Um, but, you know, it'll be a mixture of, you know, master classes at stores, universities, but also, you know, concerts at uh, performing arts centers, jazz clubs uh, and whatnot. Oh, that's awesome. It, you know, the first thought in my head, I was thinking colleges and, and I was also thinking, too, that. You know, like kids going to college nowadays, especially like, you know, when I went to college, when you went to college, no one talked about music business. No one talked about how to make a career out of this. And people can now see, you know, what you've done. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely have learned a lot and I'm still learning in these last three years about kind of what it takes to make it in the music scene. So, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a lot of stuff and it keeps evolving. It keeps changing. Uh, which is really cool. Now, I know everybody would be really angry with me if I didn't get into the extended techniques. So, you know what uh, I wanted to ask you? The rings. Are those rings that you have, because I see them on your right thumb and I think on your left thumb? Yep. Are, are those specially made rings? Uh, specially made by me, I guess. Uh, I just bought these on Amazon. You know, there was a, a period where I knew I wanted to hit the saxophone and make a sound. And so I was just experimenting. The first thing I thought was ring, metal on metal. But, you know, like what type of metal, how big does it need to be? Uh, I knew I wanted it to be mainly on my right thumb because that's the, you know, the one finger that's not pressing keys. Yeah. Yes, it holds up the sax, but, and you can see I've worn it down quite a bit, oh, this thumb yeah. holder. <laughs> Mostly that's, that was me. Now I've kind of, I'll shave it down to that point, but it also just wears it down. And that's because I don't, I like to hit not just here, but I also like to, Kind of oh, I see. Get both this and down here, so you can see it's quite a bit worn oh. right there. <laughs> and so I realized that the like steel was good, kind of heavier, heaviest metal possible. Um, and you know, I, I went ring shopping with my wife, you know, in different stores like Forever Twenty One, and I'd be like, "Do you have men's thumbs or thumb rings?" and and just getting really cheap rings online, I finally found found this like it's like slightly ribbed oh, uh, yeah. root to it, and you can actually see it's three rings. 
yeah. that are welded together. That's what that little area is. I used to just super glue. I used super glue a lot, like experimenting with super gluing little things on the sacks. But I would just super glue them together, and I just realized the the bigger mass was was louder. And then pretty much every gig, like one of them, one of the links would fall off, and I'd super glue it again. I finally found a guy who would weld it for me, just like a just some mechanic that that welded three of them together. I, I have a thumb on the left ring. I occasionally will hit this thumb rest up there. Okay. Um, and not as much because the octave key and whatnot. That's more like when I'm doing singing and I pull the sax away and I want I want that hit to be as loud as a an open slap. Got it. I also have experimented with ring, like like I had this double ring right here yeah. on my finger. That's sometimes I pick up the horn and hit different parts which you know parents always cringe when <laughs> cringe when they see me do that but you know i you know i've even i've i i had my sax repair guy uh weld on this extra little plate here and two extra here because i sometimes pound it on the stage oh. this is so it doesn't dent right there yeah um, you know, I'm just like with my music, I'm constantly experimenting on this horn. You know, this is a great P. Moriat sax, System 76. Uh, but I, yeah, I love just like, just screwing around with what would happen? What, what does it sound like if I hit your, you know, actually I bought a couple years ago, I bought just the cheapest saxophone I could find. Just this, uh, so, somewhere in Asia, there was this, this new horn for 200 bucks, oh. two tenor sax. I wasn't expecting much from it. Uh, and that's not this horn, uh, but I got it for the sole purpose of, I'm just going to beat this thing up and see what makes cool sounds. And so I didn't, so I didn't have to worry about experimenting on this one. And then I was realizing on that horn that, oh, when I, when I do this, it's kind of denting there. And so that was why I had to put this strip here. It's still denting a little bit, but I mean, that's the price you pay for, you know, trying to do something new is that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> But <laughs> I was thinking that I'm thinking, oh boy, your repairman must either love you or hate you. <laughs> yeah, it always gives me a weird look, but I think he likes me okay. more for him. So <laughs> <laughs> cool. So the rings are like the newest, aside from adding the, the vocals to that, but the rings are the newest kind of like effect. Yeah, the stomping is more new from that. Um, but the rings, and I'm always adding more rings, and I'm always, I'm always kind of experiment. You know, I just go and and. So when you, like I said, when you're trying to do kind of new stuff that maybe hasn't been done before, you're always going to have lots of things that just don't work. You know, you're going to work on something long and hard and just doesn't turn anything. And I've, I'm still waiting to like get more of this in my playing and stopping while, while doing it. And I've worked on lots of different rhythms and whatnot, but still I haven't found a way to naturally, you know, cause obviously I'm taking the horn out of my mouth to do that because that's a big thing for me is like like I said about the music dictating my practice is that like I do want things to be musical um and I also admitted earlier that I like uh, that particularly in the past I always like wanted to impress people but now it's not it's I try not to let that be my guiding thing about just impressing people or just doing flashy stuff it really I try to make it be about the music where it's like this would be really a cool contrast where if it would go into this cool like percussion thing. Uh, it, but that also means that sometimes a lot of cool ideas that I work on don't get used, you know, because it's just like, it just doesn't make sense, you know, with that's, the music. That's maturity. So, that's maturity. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, no, it, def it definitely <laughs> so, And like that, I talked about recording, you know, all these ideas on my phone. There, there are countless ideas that are on there that I haven't done anything with. And sometimes I go back and it can be like, oh, this could be used there. But there are so many things. Or, or I'll, I'll do this in like a master class where I'll talk about, you know, I, I realized one day I was really excited that I could make a sound breathing in on the saxophone. Like I could get the reed to vibrate while breathing in, uh, not circular breathing. And I started working on it for like, like a month almost, like wow. so much hours every day. Cause I was thinking I could play melodies breathing in and out. And this is what it sounds like now. 
Hold on. I can't even do it now. The point is, it sounds terrible. I, I had it to where I could play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Okay, this is terrible. I hope this is the only clip some people see of this whole interview. And like, wow, that's good. Anyways, I haven't worked on it in over a year because I was like, after a month of working on that, I was just like, this isn't going anywhere. This was just a waste. That being said, you can even turn the mistakes, you know, into something I realized that, oh, I could maybe go like, I realized I could get this kind of like record scratching sound, yeah. which isn't the most musical thing, but it's kind of a cool effect. Um, yeah, I mean, so yeah, there's a lot of that. Working on something, it doesn't work out, but then sometimes those things that don't work out can turn positive. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, I'm thinking of you as like a scientist, you know, you're experimenting with things. And, and you know, we've all heard the stories of how, you know, Einstein, you know, it took like, what, thousands of times before something was created properly, you know, it's, yeah. it's that type yeah. of thing. So there's always a good result in the end. It may not be what you thought. Yeah, there is definitely a part of me that feels, I feel like I'm part inventor uh, for some of the stuff that I'm working on. And definitely entrepreneur, you know, that's that goes back to the music business thing. And I'm just thinking about like things that inspire me these days are a lot of times because I'll, I'll admit I don't listen to a lot of sax players of recordings nowadays. Uh, I find that I'm listening to a lot like I like when I listen to jazz, I listen to a lot of piano trios. I just love the sound of that. Um, I listen to a lot of pop music. Um, I still do listen to sax players, but. Uh, but that's not maybe my main source of inspiration, but outside of music, like I love listening to podcasts or reading books about like, like biographies about inventors or just creative geniuses or creative people in other fields or entrepreneurs or, you know, just, uh, startup. I love listening, reading about startup companies. And that's where I get currently my inspiration of just like, you know, and even like self-help books about like, you know, how to stay motivation. And a lot of it's kind of fluffy, but a lot of times you just hear things that are like, oh, yeah, I could apply that to this. Or like, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own business. You know, my music career is my own business. And so that's kind of been a big inspiration for me as I think about all this stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I also wanted to ask, in terms of the extended techniques, you had put up a couple of posts where you were showing your, you have a Jody Jazz DV uh, 8 or 7 mouthpiece. Yep, 8 star. 8 star, okay. And then you've got your Legere synthetic reed, but it's covered with blood and even the BG ligature. By the way, the only reason I show that is because I know that people go crazy about that. Like, that get, always gets more likes than I ever, than I get with anything else. And people have been like, Hardcore! And this is what we sax players deal with. Um, but yeah, so so the deal is when I am playing a normal concert or my normal practicing, I don't have any any kind of bleeding like that. Um, however, with all the slap tonguing I do, where my tongue is kind of you know it's you know it's getting that suction on the reed, but it, it kind of scrapes against the reed constantly to do that. I'm doing it really fast. And this is also, particularly with my new songs, I'm slap tonguing like with some of these songs, like 90% of the of the song. Uh, whereas before it was like maybe I would go maybe just those low notes or slap tongue and then open slap on those pop sounds. Now though, a lot of oh, some of my tunes, you know, like this one. I, notes those are slap tongue the low notes are all slap tongue wow. and I'm doing this little like tongue ram slap tongue alteration when I do the back and forth but all that to say my tongue is just constantly scraping against that reed and so the big thing is if I have a day of light playing like let's say I have flown all day you know overseas and then the next day I start, I practice four hours or something. That's when it starts bleeding. Cause you know, it's like guitar players with calluses, you know, building up the callus uh, where it's really painful at first, but then 
you know, it's numb, you get the cow. The tongue, I've, I've heard that the tongue is like the fastest healing part of the body. So I'm not sure if there are really calluses, but it does seem like if there is any strength building, pretty much a day or two off and it's like kind of back to normal. <laughs> and so I just, I just have to do this regularly. All I know is I take a couple days off and if I do a hardcore practice, it's pretty much going to start bleeding. Does it hurt? But honestly, it doesn't really hurt. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It kind of like I can feel the spot. Uh, and it's usually, you know, I, I show this picture of all the blood here. And like the first time I did that, there was actually blood coming out of the key. That was when I knew when to stop. Uh, I thought it looked cool. But the truth is, it was like one little spot on the corner of my tongue where maybe it was hitting the corner of the reed over and over. And it was just just the tiniest bit coming out. But I was just like playing through it because it happens. And I'm just like, no, I want to keep going. And so I keep going and then gradually it gets more and more red. And I'm like, that you've read saxophone. <laughs> yeah. So then I, but, but it really, it really doesn't hurt um, when I, when I'm doing it. Do you think that, um, because I know you use the Legere synthetic reeds, first of all, how long have you been using them? And secondly, do you think your techniques would work just as well on cane reeds? Yeah. They, uh, first of all, they definitely, they would. Uh, you can, you can do all the stuff that I do on any setup. Um, that being said, I, you know, I have the gear that I have just because it, it helps me. I, I do the best with this gear. Um, and so like the Legere reeds, I was actually using these before, long before using the, doing any of the solo slap tongue stuff. And that was just cause I was just, I was just tired of cane reeds getting three good ones in a box of 10. Yeah. And I just couldn't, I was just like, I just can't, where else is that okay in life to buy three out of, where only three out of 10 work that you buy. Yeah, yeah. And so that was the big thing. And still for me, that's my favorite thing about Legere reads is that they're just all the same. Is that if I, you know, and they will wear down or break down, but if I do break one, I put a brand new one on and it's going to play exactly the same. Um, how long do your how long do your reeds last? And this is people have to keep in mind too, because you're doing these extended techniques. You're you're stressing the reed. Um, how long do your reeds last? Yeah. So this this is this is a tough one, <laughs> thing to answer. It it it, it depends. Um, I mean, if I were to talk about like with with regular playing, yeah. like my soprano. Now I don't play the soprano all the time. I just play it once in a while. But I've had that that reed on there for over a year. Okay. Uh, over two years. <laughs> Same thing with my alto. I could just pl keep playing on that thing. On the tenor, yes. If I'm going crazy hard, you know, it might last like, I mean, we'd be talking about like maybe a couple of weeks, but this would be, once again, with Kane, this would be like days, yeah. you know, performances. Uh, so it's tough. There's also, you know, there's two types of, of Legere reads. There's the, uh, the signature series, which are by far the best sounding, those, but to get them to sound so good, they're thinner, and those don't quite last as long. Uh, the standard cut, which was their original read, um, they are thicker. They're maybe 80% as good. Uh, those last much longer, so a lot of times I'll practice on those uh, and then perform on the, on the signatures. Cool, and the good thing about synthetic reads, you can wash off the blood. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it doesn't stick in. It doesn't stick in. Yep. And then I could say the same thing about my other equipment, you know, like the Jody Jazz mouthpiece. You could do this on any mouthpiece. Uh, but this was just the one mouthpiece that I played. I was actually at the NAM show my first time four years ago, where it was just I I never like shopping for mouthpieces. I never find a perfect one. It's like, oh, this has a good tone. It's just hard to play. Ah, this one, this is the first mouthpiece, this D V Jody Jazz, where it's just like boom with it. Five seconds, probably within the first note, I knew, wow, that's a great piece. Um, and then the ligature, I actually just switched to a BG, but this is just for, a, this is an all metal one. Um, and this is their duo series. And I think the, the, the metal ligature, you know, lets the reed vibrate a little bit more. And so it's, 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 it's more open and a, a brighter sound. And I like that kind of contemporary brighter sound. Um, and then the same thing, the P more out sax, you could do this with any sax. Um, but this horn to me just has a great vintage sound. P more out seems to be known for their, 
being modern horns, but really getting that vintage, you know, yeah. no one wants to say it, but the Mark VI kind of sound. Right. Uh, and it's just a solid thing. And I need a, I definitely need a solid horn uh, when I play. Nam, um, a year ago, I tried the P. Moriots and I wasn't, uh, I don't think they were set up right. And I was kind of disappointed. They oh. were set up much better this year. And I really like the Influence series. That that was nice. That Those horns oh. are really nice. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. Good. And just like you said, you know, you got that that big, full, rich sound, and it kind of reminded you of the Mark VI, and the key work feels good, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was it was definitely a, definitely a nicer experience. So cool. now tell your uh, if you could tell your listeners or tell the listeners where can they find you on the internet? Where can they find you on social media? Yeah, uh, so my main two hubs are well i mean there's my website derekbrownsax.com which i have kind of everything on there but then of course my youtube channel is kind of the the big thing which is just beatbox sax and uh yeah subscribe to me there and then i'm pretty uh, fairly active on instagram also beatbox sax uh and i do have a facebook band page which i think is just Derek Brown. I'm not even sure. I kind of go off and on with how much I'm into social media. Pretty much whenever I do a gig, I'll always post something uh, in all my videos. The big one is YouTube uh, and maybe Instagram. Yeah. So I think for you, then it's YouTube that's really driving people to see you. And what do you think in terms of your YouTube videos? Because I know you have, and people aren't aware, Derek has a whole bunch of tutorials on his YouTube channel about all these, you know, extended techniques, special effects that, um, you know, you could watch and, and help you. But, um, uh, you know, in terms of like YouTube, what do you think are the most popular videos? Are they the tutorial videos or are the actual, the performances of the songs? For me, yeah. definitely the performances. Yeah. Um, and there, so there's, there's this whole thing with like, you know, the science of like viral videos. And sometimes I get interested in that, you know, I definitely want to like think about marketing and like think about the best way to get, you know, my music out there to the most people. Uh, but it definitely seems like, first of all, by far my most popular is stand by me. That's yes. the one with like millions of views. And I think it's not a coincidence that it's a pop song, a, a very beloved pop song. I think no matter what, no matter how good of an original song I do, it's never going to top that in terms of views. And that's always something I kind of have to think about. Like, is it more about the views or is it about kind of pursuing, you know, my, whatever my vision is? Uh, I think it is good to think about, you know, like I said, the marketing, it is good. To, of course you want to think about your audience. Like I talk about how music is, it's everyone can agree. It's a form of communication. It's a language. And so you have to be thinking about the person you're communicating to, you know, uh, that being said, you know, there's this term that a lot of us musicians are afraid of selling out, you know? Uh, and so, you know, it kind of comes up where, you know, people put certain genres or musicians and say, oh, I'll call them a sell. First of all, if you love doing it, that's not selling out at all. So if I love playing Stand By Me, and I do, it's fun to play when audiences sing along, you know, that's great. And I probably will never get sick of playing that song at concerts because people always love to hear it. And that's, that's fun. It's connecting with the audience. That being said, if the only thing I wanted to do was get more views and get a chance to have a viral video, I would only do cover songs. Uh, and I would think about keeping them really short and all this kind of stuff. And to me, you know, maybe sometimes, and I think artists can learn from this of like, maybe sometimes you can quote unquote, throw the dog a bone. <laughs> like, okay, I'm not really listening to this, but okay, this is a popular song. Maybe I could do this one. Maybe this would make people happy. And that's, that's fine. Uh, but more and more now, like I said, I like writing my own songs. And a song that I write is never going to be as big as a Beatles song or a Rolling Stones song. I know there's a chance, but it's just, it's not likely. But still, for me, I thrive. I thrive on, you know, it motivates me to come up with new songs and like new challenges. And so writing lyrics. And so, I, yeah, that's, I think, why in my new album, I have less cover songs and more of my original stuff. Um, that being said, uh, it's still, you know, because I've, I have now this kind of growing subscriber list and now that kind of people 
expect music from me. You know, it's, it is easier to get this stuff out there. And if I do take a risk with the song, I still know that a fair amount of people will see it, which is cool. Um, and the tutorials are still popular, some much more than others. Like the one where I'm talking about slap tonguing, because that's a topic, you know, that's so it's such a key thing. But then I have silly tutorials where I'm like, how to play with a static sound, which like it sounds like there's static. It's basically just playing with spit on your reed, <laughs> so you can just hear it hit. That doesn't have a ton of views. Not a big surprise. Uh, you know, I could talk a lot about the music business side of of YouTube and social media, but you know, a key thing for me is just somewhat regularly be posting stuff so that people, you know, are aware that you're out there still doing stuff. Uh, it motivates me to keep coming up with new stuff uh, as well. But one thing that I try not to get caught up in, because I remember with my first videos, just looking so much at the numbers of the views and like it was, it's fun when one does really well, but when one does like kind of well, instead of being happy, I'm depressed. Yeah. You know, I, I joke about this, this, this happened to me, like the first video that I released, my first one on YouTube, Catch Him Up, it's just an original song. You know, it quickly got up to like 100,000 views and I was like blown away by that. And that was in like a couple of weeks. And then I was really excited for my second video because it, it was a cover song, uh, Every Breath You Take. And I was excited about the look of it and the sound of it. And I was like, and now I have some subscribers on YouTube. It's gonna be huge. And it got to like, 50,000 views and had that happened a month ago I would have been so excited and blown away but because it happened after the one that got 100,000 views I was depressed I was only sad wow. I didn't feel good at all and that just shows how fickle fleeting fame and I don't even want to call it fame but just if you get focused on those numbers it will just drive you nuts and you won't ever be happy and when you are happy you'll be happy for like two seconds. <laughs> and so it's more, it's, you know, it's a cliche, but it's gotta be about the journey. It's not that end product. It's about, are you being fulfilled with what you're doing? You know, it would be hard if, if absolutely no one was interested or listening, I will admit that. Uh, but just knowing that if some people are listening, that I am able to do, make a career out of this, uh, you know, that, that is so motivating to me. And I just got to keep reminding myself, it's not about the views. It's about, you know, growing as a musician, having fun doing this. Um, yeah. That's, that's, that's a great way to, uh, kind of end this interview. You know, you, you touched upon so many points and, you know, in particular, you know, the, the idea of whether we call it selling out or not, it's not that it's really, I think, you know, it's, I'm kind of injecting my own opinion here, but it's also, you know, we're connecting with audiences, as you yeah. have said. You know, if you're not connecting with audiences, then it, it makes it that much more difficult. It's not necessarily sharing. It's not necessarily music per se, I guess. But yeah. what I really admired is, you know, you were so, like, candid and, and, you know, honest about, like, how you felt, you know, throughout the various stages of your career. You know, the insecurity and, and uh, feeling in between genres and thinking, you know, where do I fit in? And then... And then, you know, like I've said to you many times, just finding your own voice and just bringing the saxophone to a whole other level. You know, um, you had, and I said this to you at the NAM uh, jam, Charlie Parker did his thing and brought the saxophone to a certain level. Coltrane did his thing. Ornette Coleman did his thing. But now you're bringing the saxophone to another level. And you should be really wow. proud of that because it's, it's really, it's inspiring. And I'm hoping that the people listening to this feel as inspired as I do. Um, just, you know, again, your, your honesty and just talking about the fact that this is a lifelong journey. It's not a magic pill. You know, um, you didn't all of a sudden say, oh, I'll do beatboxing and boom, there it is. I'm famous. No, it doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of hard work still to keep that up and keep that going. So um, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, can we end with a little bit of an excerpt of a tune? Sure. Let's do it. Uh, how long do you want me to play for? Maybe a couple of minutes or something like that. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll play. I'll play the song "Diakuyu," which this was inspired by a trip to the Ukraine that was just super inspiring. Really great audiences. Um, and "Diakuyu" means thank you, Ukraine. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Moccasins on before, but <laughs> <laughs> the moccasin version. Yes, <laughs> that was so awesome. I wanted to thank you so much, Derek, for your time and uh, you know your inspiration and everything that you do, and uh, you know wishing you all the best. And you know I'm a huge fan. Thank you so much. Oh. Well, thank you, Donna. Thanks for having me, and uh, and I love your questions. Uh, usually, I'm only talking about the technique. Uh, but like you said, that stuff's all on YouTube, uh, so people can find that elsewhere. So, yeah, I appreciate your, your insights and your questions. <laughs>